So I'm going to talk about cloud computing. Uh, the agenda for uh, this next 25 minutes or so is I will describe for non-technical people what is the cloud. This is not a technical presentation, uh, although I'm a bit of a techie myself. Uh, what is the cloud? What, what is the cloud not? What is not the cloud? Uh, what can you do in the cloud with cloud systems these days? Uh, what you shouldn't do or shouldn't uh, consider or think about with uh, cloud systems? And then should you guys and your businesses be looking at using cloud systems for, uh, for various things uh, in your uh, places of work? So we'll uh, hopefully get through all of that in about 25 minutes and have hopefully a few minutes at the end for questions. So what is the cloud? Who's heard the term? We've all heard the term the cloud. Have you heard other terms? Have you heard SaaS? Who's heard of SaaS? Software as a service. Uh, then the SaaS is a good one. There's, there's, oops, sorry, wrong button. SaaS is software as a service, which is just another fancy way of saying cloud services. There's also infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, desktop as a service, backend as a service. There's a whole bunch of different terms, web computing, online services, browser-based systems. By and large, they're all basically the same thing for us normal humans that don't have to worry about the technical details. So when you see all these terms, I'm calling it the cloud, okay? and technically inclined people would beg to differ with me, but for our purposes, the cloud is all these things and more, uh, but you don't need to worry too much about the specific terminology. I'm going to describe the cloud in very general, hopefully understandable terms, and we'll go on from there. So the Oxford Dictionary defines cloud as a noun, meaning a visible mass of condensed watery vapor floating in the atmosphere. Actually, the Oxford Dictionary has about six definitions for cloud. I chose two here. So that's cloud. Most of us, when we hear the word cloud, we think of a cloud, white and fluffy. What does that have to do with computer systems? Actually, I think the one, the, the definition that, that uh, actually is maybe a little bit more relevant for cloud computing is something that obscures. Now, it's not something that obscures in a bad way. It's something that obscures and hides from us unnecessary details. Okay? And I'll explain that a little bit further as we go through the rest of the presentation. So in English, I looked, I googled the cloud, and I thought about it, and I've done the cloud for years, and I thought, what? Where have I ever seen a definition of what the cloud is that would be useful to, to normal people as opposed to computer geeks? And I couldn't come up with one. I couldn't find one. They were all long-winded and complex and required acronyms and, and some knowledge of the industry. So I've tried to put it in English. For us, the cloud is using a computer system that's somewhere else. And that's it in a nutshell. Using a computer system that's somewhere else. So you're not installing a system in your office or your place of work, it's somewhere else, and that's fine. I'll explain what that means a little bit more as we go along here. So common aspects. These days, most cloud systems are accessed via the internet. And that's actually where the term the cloud came from. The internet is often referred to as the cloud because it's this amorphous thing out there, and nobody, no single person in the world knows all the connections on the internet. There's simply too many of them. So they can start calling it the cloud because we connect to the internet, we go to Starbucks, and we connect with our iPads or our phones or our computers, and it somehow connects us to the website or whatever it is we're looking for. We don't know how, but we don't really care. It's like a phone, a phone system. It connects to the phone network somehow, and there are people who know how, but most of us don't really care as long as it works. Right? So that's a common aspect of today's cloud systems is they're, based, they're out there in the internet. All you have to do is be able to connect to the internet to access your cloud system. Usually, not always, but usually what we refer to as cloud systems are things that are out there in the internet somewhere, and we get to them using a browser. So Internet Explorer or Firefox or Safari or Chrome, Google Chrome. Uh, one of those browsers, we get to the system via a browser. So it's like going to a website. Okay. Other common... Uh, aspects of cloud systems these days is, well, actually cloud systems ever, is you don't really know where it physically is. Right? And you don't really care, right? As long as it's out there and it's reliable, you don't need to know where the servers that you're accessing and doing stuff with, you don't need to know where they are, but that's okay because, again, we don't know where the machines that connect the phone systems are, but we don't care as long as it works. Right? The other thing about cloud systems that um, people don't necessarily think about first is 
They're usually extremely large scale and highly redundant. And that's one of the reasons why we put systems in the cloud is because there are big advantages of saying, well, rather than you having a system and you having a system and you having a system and all of you have to make them work and you have to get help to make them work usually, let's put all of your systems in one place and get the experts to work on them all together and have these economies of scale. And we've heard about economies of scale in manufacturing. We've heard about economies of scale in economies in general. With the cloud out there, there are even greater benefits to economies of scale. And I will get into that in a little bit uh, more detail later on. But that very large scale and highly redundant means that individually we're not paying a lot. But we're getting the benefits of the huge scale that the cloud companies, so Amazon and Microsoft and, and Google, uh, they can invest the sums of money and the time re required to get that very large scale, and then they can share it out with thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of people, and, uh, and the cost comes down from there. Okay. So cloud and not cloud. Some people are more visual. So I've described what I think is an English, uh, uh, a workable definition of, of the cloud. This is diagrammatic for those who are more visual. This is very, very simple on-premise or traditional system, a non-cloud system. You've got laptops and PCs and terminals and physical hardware, and they're wired to something called a, a switch or a router, and that's wired to the server, and the whole lot is in your office. Fairly straightforward. We've probably all got some sort of network or computers that are wired together in our office. Even, s even small home-based businesses these days tend to have at least a couple of computers that are wired together. So what is, how does that differ when you talk about being in the cloud? And it's really very simple. You've taken the server and you've put it somewhere else. And the cloud is the bit in between that obscures from you where the server physically is. You're still doing things with your laptops and your PCs and your terminals. In the office, they're probably still wired together so you can share files around together and things like that. There's a router that connects it to the internet and then the internet takes care of the rest, just like the phone system. We don't know how the phone system connects when we dial those 10 digits, but it does. So the server is somewhere else. Other than that, it's basically the same uh, as, a, as a non cloud system. But what the cloud does for us, apart from that large scale and redundancy that we talked about earlier, what the cloud also does for us is it says, well, that server, and I've moved the server into the cloud, is accessible at the office, but it's also accessible from our phones and our tablets and our, our laptops at Starbucks or at home or anywhere in the world that I want to access that system. So I've instantly, by putting the system in the cloud, I've instantly given myself access. If I want to grant, you know, or whoever, I want to grant access to the system, if I give them the logins and they can prove that they're the right person, they can access that system from anywhere in the world. Without wiring each office in. So if I open a new office in Chicago, I'm already connected. They just have to have an internet connection and away they go. They can connect to the system uh, just as easily as they could from home or from the existing office in Vancouver. So now I'm going to go to common myths. And there's a lot of fear around the cloud and cloud systems, especially amongst business people, because we don't understand how it works. But there probably was a lot of fear and trepidation about phone systems when they first came in and faxes and things like that. You know, I don't know if this could be useful. Is, how does it work? Is it safe? Is it secure? Well, the same issues have come up around the cloud, but there's uh, four myths that I'm going to hopefully dispel as we go through here. Myth number one, the cloud is not safe. That couldn't be further from the truth. One of the things that I think people ha are slowly coming to realize is that when you have a system that's in the cloud, it's safer. Safer than you could possibly make a system in your own office. Even very large companies simply can't afford to spend the kind of money that re that's required to get the physical security, the firewalls, the antivirus, the backups and fail safes and power redundancy and so on, uh, and the monitoring that's required to make that system as safe as you can when you're in the cloud. And again, it's the economy of scale. So Microsoft and Google and Amazon and uh, all these people they have these huge economies of scale, so they put the very best firewalls in place. Very, very, very difficult to break into a, uh, a hosted system. In your office, 
You might have a good firewall, you might have the standard protections. It will not be as good as a cloud system. Physical security. How many people here have had their office broken into in, say, the last 10 years? Oh, come on, somebody must have. Okay, so you're the special crowd that has never had any break-ins in the last 10 years. It happens, right? Physical security is a problem. We've had many clients over the years that have had break-ins, and people steal computers because they can flog them for something. Now, usually, it's relatively harmless. It's a nuisance because they steal the computers and they flog them out the back of a truck. But if somebody was to find somebody that you didn't want to was to find the, those servers or buy them and access the information on them, you know, that would be a worry. You need to have a retina scan to get into the building of most major data centers. So you have to have an invitation, you have to prove who you are, and they will scan your retina to make sure that you're the right person that's authorized to get into that building. Uh, and I've never had an invitation, so I've never had my retina scanned. So myth number one, the cloud is very, very safe. Okay, it is very reliable, it's very secure, it is very um, uh, consistent, so it's up all the time. Uh, stuff never gets stolen from cloud uh, data centers. Myth number two, I could lose my data or I could lose control of my data. Now, there is a grain of truth in this one. However, it really is an overblown fear. Cloud systems have again, the economy of scale, and they're constantly backing up all, all the information on, that, uh, on those, their servers. And that is a technology which is widely used. Only large companies, generally speaking, can afford to do it in-house. But the, again, the economies of scale for cloud systems, they're constantly replicating all the information that they're hosting for you and for thousands of others to other servers that are physically separate. So for instance, Microsoft has uh, four data centers in the US for hosting CRM and Office 365 and, and other things. And they are constantly replicating. Everything that's on each one of those data centers is being replicated to one of the other three data centers in North America, seven by 24, all the time. So in theory, if somebody nuked Seattle, hope not, but if they did, you'd be disconnected, give it a couple of minutes, reconnect, and you'd have lost a few minutes worth of work, but your data would be live and up and running on a different data center. It might be in Chicago, it might be in Atlanta, it might be in Houston. We don't know, and again, we don't care. Because it's out there, it's replicated, it's super reliable. So they don't do traditional backups. You don't have to change the tape every night or put a new disk in to burn your backups. They're constantly replicating things all the time. So there is redundancy in the systems. They also have redundant other systems. Power, cooling, internet connectivity. One of the big advantages that, that people um, in companies that have multiple offices, uh, the, uh, it, it encourages them to go to cloud, is that if I have five offices, I have head office and I have four branch offices, and I have all my systems at head office, well, I've got maybe an internet connection for each office, including head office. What happens if there's a power failure at head office? Now all five locations are down. Right? If I'm in the cloud and I have a power failure at head office, well, head office is down. But the four branches can keep going because the system is in the cloud. The data centers that hold these things, if their power goes down, they have power generators. They keep going. They have redundant internet connections. Somebody digs up an internet line and knocks out half of Seattle. Well, they have a redundant connection. They're going to be connected to the other half of Seattle, and they'll carry on. So that redundancy, again, is on a scale that we can't possibly replicate ourselves in each of our, in our individual uh, businesses. There is that grain of truth, though. One of the things you must be careful of, if you are looking at a cloud system, is make sure that you read the contract and find out how you get your data when, uh, when you might decide to move to a different provider. Okay? So one of the things that occasionally is a problem with cloud uh, services is the providers don't give you the ability to pull the data off and take it to somewhere else. They try and lock you in. Okay? Not many companies do it, but there are some out there. So check that one. If you're looking to move part of your business onto the cloud, just make sure that they have a policy where if you ask for your data, they'll give it to you in a nice, convenient format so that you can go to a different cloud system or pull that data and go in-house again. That happens too. You know, there are other reasons why you might do that. But if you do need to get your data, all of it, in a useful, useful fashion, rather than running a bunch of reports to get it, make sure that's in the contract. Myth number three, the cloud is too bleeding edge. It's too high tech, it's, it's a little bit out there. Well, again, cloud computing 
The original cloud computing is actually from the mainframe days back in the 70s. Back when we didn't have personal computers and everything was running on mainframes and, and minis, everything was cloud, as it were. You weren't hosting anything in your office because it was far too expensive. So all the systems were cloud systems back then. Nowadays, on the internet-based cloud systems, which is subtly different, that's also been around for more than a decade. So Microsoft and Salesforce and Google, they've been doing cloud stuff for a long, long time now. They've worked with the huge server farms where you've got hundreds of thousands of users. They've worked with the redundancy where you've got to replicate across multiple data centers around the world. They've worked with all the issues around making this thing go 7 by 24 because when we go to sleep, the London office is just waking up and they need to go and carry on. They've dealt with all of that and they've gained more than a decade of experience in making it super reliable, super uh, uh, robust. So it's a mature, uh, robust and proven technology now. It's not bleeding edge anymore. Ten years ago, maybe, but now it's something that uh, actually we do all the time. Myth number four, it's cheaper in the long run to own. Now, most people, I've found, when they think about renting software or software subscriptions, they look at it and say, yeah, but wouldn't it be better if I owned it? Because sooner or later, I'm going to spend more paying a monthly fee than I would spend if I just bought it. I'm just in the process of buying a new car, and I can say for cars, absolutely. When you're buying a car, all things being equal, leasing it, eventually it's going to cost you more, right? You're paying for the privilege. The car is a certain price. We all have to put the same amount of gas in our car. We still have to do the oil changes. Those costs are constant whether we lease or buy. But for computer systems, the answer is not necessarily. In fact, often the answer is no. It's not cheaper to, to own. Come back to the economies of scale. Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they have these huge economies of scale. So we talked about your system and your system and your system being Individually set up, that's very expensive by comparison to one great big system being set up and you getting a little slice, you getting a little slice. Those economies of scale are, in fact, quite incredible. So the cloud companies can provide you with that system for less than the cost of maintaining your own system, okay? let alone buying it, just maintaining it. What I've done, actually, for a few different customers is I've done a little analysis of that. So I, 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 there's only four graphs, okay, four charts, that's it, I promise. So here's the standard thought process. If I buy it, it costs me X dollars, flat line. If I rent it, it costs me so much a month forever. Well, at some point the lines cross and it's going to cost me more to rent. Okay? And for a lot of systems, that point there happens to be about three and a half years from now. Right? So that's, that's the simple analysis. But when you start adding in a few more of the other things, you say, okay, well, at first glance, it's that. Well, what if you want to keep the software up to date? Well, the software companies don't do that for free. So every year or so, now I've shown here three years included in your purchase price, but then on the third year, there's a little, you know, 16 to 20% annual maintenance cost to keep the software up to date. So now this line isn't flat anymore, but it's still below the green line. Okay, well then, hang on a second, add in the cost of servers. This is for most small businesses, this is the biggest factor. If I buy a system of any size, I have to buy a server to run it on. If you're subscribing to an online cloud service, you're not buying the, the hardware at all. In fact, they almost throw that in for free. They rent you the use of the software, and you don't pay for the hardware at all. But if you factor that into the cost of owning, well, you've got to buy it, you've got to maintain it, and every five years, you have to replace it. Nobody will s sell you a warranty on a server that'll go longer than five years. Even the super extended warranty fails, uh, runs out in five years. So now the line is a little bit more gray. Last but not least, you have to keep that server running. And again, you have to do it individually. That's your server. You have to pay somebody to keep that thing running. And if you hire a company to do it, they'll charge you two or $300 at least per server to keep it running per month. If you're doing it in-house, one way or another, it's costing you two or three hundred dollars a month. It might cost you a thousand dollars one month and zero dollars the next month, but it will, over time, it'll cost you a certain amount to keep that server running. Well, when you factor all these costs in, this green line is below the red line forever, because the cost of keeping it going in-house outweighs the cost of renting it from somewhere else. Plus, 
you've got the capital investment in the first place. Now, the numbers di differ from company to company. So we've created a little spreadsheet where you plug in the numbers. Okay? And these are real numbers. This is a real example, not a made-up one for the presentation. Uh, this is Microsoft Dynamics CRM buying it and buying a server versus Microsoft Dynamics CRM online subscribing on it per month. This is a 15-user sort of typical-ish uh, scenario. If anybody wants a copy of the spreadsheet and you want to look at a cloud system, you're considering what are the, all the costs, we'll uh, quite have you give us your, your business card at the end of the presentation and we'll, uh, we'll send you a copy of the spreadsheet. You can plug your own numbers in and see where these lines cross or if they cross at all. Okay, that was the last chart, I promise. Okay, so next topic. What is available in the cloud? Well, these days, just about anything, just about anything you do on the computer systems in your office right now probably has an equivalent offering available somewhere in the cloud. Might not be the same product, but there'll be a similar product that's hosted or available uh, in a cloud system. The most common uses, and these are the sort of chronologically the ones that started, f started off first and, and uh, came along later, email, telephony, and messaging. Most of us do some sort of cloud-based email. If you've got a Shaw account, that's a cloud system. Gmail, Hotmail, they're all cloud-based. File sharing. Who here uses iCloud off their iPhone or their um, iPad? That's a cloud-based system. Okay. It's all on the internet. We don't know where those files are being saved, but they are being saved. And they're redundant, so we'll never lose them. Document management collaboration. Who uses Google Docs or SharePoint? Again, show of hands. So those are cloud-based systems. So they're out there. Again, huge server farms. We're paying to rent a small fraction of it, and it's cheaper than owning it ourselves, and it's more secure. CRM, that's our particular area. We do CRM in the, uh, in the cloud. And so CRM is a widely used cloud-based system, a business system, not you know, going beyond uh, file and document management. You can even put your entire business infrastructure in the cloud nowadays. So with products like Windows Azure, you can have everything, your servers, different applications, even if they weren't built for the cloud, you can put the whole thing up in the cloud and have somebody else take care of it. You don't have to worry about all that infrastructure. I'm sorry, infrastructure is a computer industry buzzword for hardware and networks. Okay? So your hardware can be somewhere else, and they will take uh, care of it for you. Okay, so those are more common ones, but again, uh, QuickBooks as a cloud offering. Uh, I think simply does too. All sorts of different systems now have cloud equivalents or offerings uh, for you to consider. So you probably already use it. Who here, who here has a Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo uh, mail account? It's cloud. And we've had them for years probably. Um, Blackberry Messaging, Office 365, Exchange and Link, all cloud-based systems. We already know some people use iCloud or Google Docs, Office 365 SharePoint, Dropbox. Has anybody heard of Dropbox? Yeah. Again, uh, that's a free one, isn't it? Well, there's a free version of it. So, I mean, you can't get much cheaper than that. Zero dollars per month, right? And Dropbox will look after your stuff uh, in, in the cloud. And does anybody know where the Dropbox servers are? No, I have no idea. No. And, and really, we don't care because they're out there. And there's copies, multiple copies of your files that you've put in Dropbox are save, saved somewhere. Okay, I talked about CRM. Now, we do Microsoft Dynamics CRM online. There's Salesforce. There's Sugar CRM. There's literally hundreds uh, of other uh, CRM systems available online in the cloud. And we talked about Windows Azure. Okay, what is not suitable to be put in the cloud? When should you not use a cloud system? Because there are circumstances. It's not a panacea for everybody all the time. One area which can be problematic is when you have tightly integrated systems. So if you have a system that either is or has to be, in particular, physically at your factory or your office, and you need that to be tightly integrated with another system, and they're going to exchange a lot of data constantly, and, and you want it to be high speed, well, you put one of those systems in the cloud, now you've got a narrow pipe which is your internet connection, for the two of them to talk to each other. Now, these days, that matters less and less because that narrow pipe isn't so narrow as it used to be five uh, years ago or ten years ago. But that's a consideration. That's a reason why some people would put a system on-premise rather than in the cloud. This is probably the most common reason why you wouldn't go into the cloud because it's a black-and-white thing. 
if there are regulatory restrictions. So if you're in the healthcare uh, industry uh, in, in BC, for instance, you are legally required not to have people's personal health records or any component of their health records outside of BC. They must be kept on a server in BC, which is an old law. It's probably less secure than if you were allowed to put them outside of BC, but I don't see it changing anytime soon. Uh, education institutions, again, can't have cloud-based systems outside of the province uh, if they're uh, primary or secondary. Interestingly, tertiary education institutions can, because when the tertiary students log in, they're old enough to say, oh, I waive my right to having this stuff stored in BC. Closely allied with that is what I call politics, the Patriot Act. Some people have a moral or ethical problem with the Patriot Act. In fact, lots of us have a moral ethical problem with the Patriot Act. And some systems are only hosted in the states. Therefore, theoretically at least, they're open to inspection from um, Homeland Security. If that's a concern for you, then that would be reason. Now, I put that in there, but really what that means is, well, I would like to be in the cloud for all the reasons I spoke of earlier, but I don't want to be hosted in the States. So you need to go and say, I need to find a Canadian hosting company that guarantees the stuff will be hosted in Canada and therefore not subject to the Patriot Act. High performance tuning. The cloud is out there steady, reliable, predictable, and it's that big scale. So the performance is good, but it's steady and predictable. It's not lightning fast. If you need something to be lightning fast, if you uh, have somebody at a kiosk who's dealing with the public and you need to turn a customer, you know, they need to get them through that turnstile 30, 30 seconds or less, you've got something that needs to be very, very highly tuned, and I'm talking very highly tuned for performance, Having it on-premise allows you to then say, I'm going to throw more hardware at it or more RAM and processor power. And so you have control over the performance. If you're cloud-based, you're dealing with an internet connection. As I mentioned earlier, there are limitations to how, um, uh, well, for most of us with limited budgets, to how fast your internet connection can be. That's less and less of a concern as time goes by. But if performance is really, really critical to you and you want to be able to fine-tune it, then obviously having your own system, it's like owning a custom-made car versus owning a Toyota, right? Okay. Toyota's good for most of us. It's reliable, it's economic, it's got decent performance for most of us above the age of 20. But if I want to go drag racing, I'm going to build a custom dragster, right? So that still applies. I think this is the last topic. Should you use the cloud? As I mentioned earlier, you probably already do. A lot of us use iCloud and Gmail and stuff like that. And because it's somewhat transparent, we you know, may not have realized it. Having said that, when you start looking at business systems or things that you're currently not doing in the cloud, should you use the cloud? Well, take it a step at a time. You don't need to put everything on the cloud. It's not an all or nothing uh, uh, scenario. So pick and choose and put a piece on the cloud. So if you are currently storing all your documents, you know, say you've got CAD drawings or Word documents that people in your office need to share, and they're on a server right now, well, maybe that's an area where you say, you know, we could put that in the cloud because we've got people who work from home or that work remotely, or we have a, we're opening a second office. Maybe it's worth putting those in the cloud, okay? And the most important time you should think about um, using the cloud is before you buy another server. Every five years, if any of you have servers that are more than five years old, you need to fix that because they're not under warranty. And if they fall over, you won't be able to get replacement parts. But most of us replace our servers every three to five years. Okay. Before you do the next one, think about, is it worth replacing? Or should I move what's currently on that server into the cloud? Because that's obviously uh, the ideal time to do it. You'll save that capital investment. The headaches of keeping it running will go away. And if it makes sense, that's the time to move. I'm a little bit over here, so I will very quickly ask, uh, um, allow you guys to ask questions. I'm sorry, I've, I started late, so I finished almost exactly on time. Any questions? Does anybody there have uh, systems that you're considering putting out there in the cloud that you don't already have in the cloud? Apart from your um, iPhone song collection. Yeah. So if anybody has any questions or thinks of anything later, there's my email address. If you'd like a copy of the presentation or that spreadsheet that gives you the calculation so you can do your own analysis of whatever system you might be thinking about putting on the cloud, just give me your business card or email me at, uh, at that email address and we'll, uh, we'll send you both. No problem at all. And thank you very much. <laughs>